Okay, welcome back to class, everybody. We're trying out some new uh, equipment, new technology. Bear with us. All right. We're trying to um, okay. set up a system that we can actually receive your responses because we haven't been getting your responses and we want to be able to respond back. So. Uh, we're, we're trying something a little different today, so I, I hope you can, you know, things don't come out quite right. It's because we're learning it, okay? A huge thank you to my son, Casey. He's my tech, he's the techie, and he really works very hard to, to make sure we can do the best streaming, uh, you know, that, that's possible. So we're grateful for him and for each of you, all right? So as we uh, prepare to go into class again, uh, I have to say thank you again to all my, all those who joined us in the Passover fast. I believe we're starting to see the results of that. I hope you've been paying attention because we want you to understand that the prayers of the righteous really do avail much. And when we, you know, go before the Lord, he does hear us. And um, you're starting to see the, the numbers, the counts are going down. And, uh, you know, just because you're not fasting now doesn't mean that, you know, you don't have the results. You, you can continue to pray. Of course we are. We, we continue to pray. Uh, but we're also looking at the results and we're seeing that, um, you know, things are, you know, really impacted, you know, by us when we walk in our authority. So again, thank you for that. And of course, I have to, you know, say a shout out again to all those that are working so diligently during this very challenging, very trying time. And thank you for letting me know the different ones that I didn't call because I, that's what I want you to do is help me. So again, a huge thank you to all the doctors and the nurses and a huge thank you out to the social workers, especially in Brooklyn, not only Brooklyn, but certainly we know that they took a real hard hit there. And so we, we're praying for you. Just know that the prayers of the righteous are availing on your behalf to all the social workers there, to, to all the home health care workers who are going into people's homes and you know, just getting it done. Thank you so much. A huge thank you. And EMS workers, uh, again, all the first responders, the, the assistant living care people and the pharmacists who are really, uh, again, frontline people, our police officers, very, very, you know, important job that they're doing. All the retail workers who are working in the stores day and night and, uh, all the teachers who are still working over the internet to make sure our children are, you know, being cared for in their education. What a blessing that is to all of our military people. They, we, they have put a call out to them and now they have to, you know, be employed as well. And a special huge thank you to all the truckers because I got lots of family members that are truckers and, you know, they keep the shelves filled. They keep us really, you know, with our needs being met in, in that area. So we're just thankful and we just think it's necessary, you know, to give honor to whom honors do and to let them know that they're not just out there, but we are literally praying for them. And uh, we just believe that God is just covering them and all that they are doing in Jesus name. All right. And so again, if, if I missed anyone, just send it to me. I'd be more than glad to, you know, put a thank you out to them because they deserve it. And we want to uh, be able to do that in Jesus name. All right. In fact, I just feel like I want to pray for all of them right now. And, and I just lift them up. So spirit of the living God in the name of Jesus, I just thank you right now that the prayers of the righteous are availing much. And we thank you for those who are out on the front lines and that they are really caring and loving for your people, Lord. And so we cover them as, as you cover them, Lord. And as they cover, you know, all the people, we just lift up the prayers in, in Jesus' mighty name. And we thank you that your hand of mercy and protection is upon them. We suffer no hurt, harm, or danger to come to them, that it will not come nigh unto them, not this disease, not this uh, virus, not anything, but in the name of Jesus, they are covered and protected. And we thank you, God, that you'll bring increase into their lives in Jesus' name, that they will lack nothing as it is that they are looking out for your people in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And we thank God again for each and every one of you. All right, again, now, just to stay updated with us, be, be up on things, sign up for our emailing list, go to wordupinc.org, that's W-O-R-D-U-I, 
www.wordnc.org. Uh, also, you can text, just take your phone, text WORDUP to 40691. 40691. And literally, we can give you all the updates. We can keep you uh, totally, you know, informed on what's going on. And, and we can literally uh, keep you informed. All right, Find, follow us on Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, okay, and YouTube. All right, we, we love to, to hear from you as well. Uh, our email is wordupinc at yahoo.com. All right, so we always do that because we know that there are some people that are new and that are joining us, and we want you uh, to just be with us in all that we're doing. Amen? All right, so we have a really good study for you today, and again, you'll want to have your notebooks. Listen, I read some of your papers. Wow, those of you that have turned your papers in early, oh, just blew me away. Uh, I said keep it coming. That That's really good. That's exactly what we want to hear. Again, we're not just doing this. Uh, just to say you passed a grade or you passed a class. And this, is, this is life, people, God. This is life. And we want you to, uh, you know, experience what we're teaching, okay? We, we don't want just information. We want revelation, okay? So uh, thank you. Those papers were very awesome. I, I just love reading them. I, I just started. I thought I would brief right through them, and then after a while, I couldn't put them down. I said, they're, they're really getting this word. So bless you, each and every one of you, again, that have turned your papers in. The rest of you, come on, keep it coming. We're looking forward to reading it. Uh, the, the, your paper's coming directly to me because I really, it helps me to see what else I need to do, what I need to put emphasis on, you know, where we can move on to a different direction or whether we need to stay in a certain area. So that's, that's why we in, encourage you to, you know, write us if you're not a student and involved in the class for, for the, uh, graduation at the end of the year, it's okay, you can still write me, you can still email me, let me know what, what you're getting. Some of you have been doing that and I thank you for that as well. Uh, all right, so we're gonna get into our study. And I'm, again, I'm trying to get used to this new <laughs> technology. All right, um, you know we're studying the kingdom and I thank God for it because it's, it's blessing and changing your life. That's what it's supposed to do, it has the capacity uh, the Word of God has always been an enlightening and something to move and change your life. It's not religion. It's got nothing to do with religion. All right. So, Spirit of the Living God, we thank you now for the Word that we're about to receive and that we're about to share. And we thank you for the lives that will literally be changed forever. Bless now, O oh God, this your Word. <clears throat> bless your people with the revelation knowledge that literally will change and bless their lives. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, so many of you know we've been studying this whole realm of kingdom, and, you know, we're, we've been getting it kind of on personal levels because we want you to understand, again, how kingdom begins to reveal you, you know, the real person of who you are, which most people don't even realize how important that is and how much we don't know about ourselves. So getting into the realm of kingdom, again, we have some real powerful word. And, and let's start again. Now, you know our foundational scripture. I don't have to tell you. Most of you, you already wrote that and told me about it. So I know you know. Uh, but again, I repeat it for those who, because we keep getting new uh, listeners, new, new viewers, and we love that. And we want them to be in on what we're doing as well. So our foundational scripture for all our new people is Matthew 6, verse 33, okay, where Jesus himself says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So, it, it, those are good instructions, and it helps us, but we want to dig a little deeper into it. And we wanted you to understand the realm of kingdom. Kingdom is, is not just a a, a word that sounds good. It is literally uh, the realm of heaven. When he said, you know, you pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now, it's interesting that Jesus told his disciples to pray thy kingdom come because that prayer not only was introducing them to what was to come, okay, because as much as he had came, he still hadn't died on the cross yet. 
and the kingdom could not be released to them until, you know, he had, you know, completed the finished work of the cross. And so he said, when you pray, you pray, you know, thy kingdom come. In other words, they didn't even realize they were praying for him to fulfill those scriptures of, you know, the suffering and the passion of Christ that he would have to deal with. So again, this is so important because it started the whole, you know, ball rolling in terms of understanding the kingdom, even though they, they really didn't quite get it. All right, so I want to move now to John 3.16, again, an area that we've covered before, but, uh, you know, I keep getting more revelation on it, and so, of course, I'm going to keep sharing it because the more I get, the more I can give to you. So you all know John 3.16, of course. For God so loved the world. And I emphasize that because somehow the attitude of the church is against the world. Everything is so worldly and this and that, and it's almost got turned into something that, that's really very negative and also very wrong because he says he loved the world. Well, if God loved the world, you know, we got to understand the difference here in terms of our attitude as the body of Christ towards the world and how God feels about the world. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, it's open. This is, again, a part of the commonwealth. It's open to everyone. It is not an exclusive club for just church folk. And let me tell you something. Hating the world, that's not the attitude. How are you going to get your loved ones that are out in the world saved if you have an attitude, you know, of, of anger and hatred? And, and, you know, that kind of attitude is totally wrong. You're going to have to join, come in agreement with the realm of God, so love the world that he gave his only begotten son because we want our loved ones saved and many of them are, you know, partaking in the realm of the world. Now, like I said, we don't love what they do, but we certainly still love them. You don't love what's going on in the world, but you have to love God's people. And that's what's going to change, you know, the situation in terms of people being saved. The church has got to stop hating the world, okay? We, we, we're supposed to be the ones to bring them, you know, and lead them into Christ. All right, verse 17, very important scripture. Everybody knows, you know, verse 16. For God's a love the world. We all know that one. But when it gets to verse 17, you ask them, what's the next verse? Most don't know. Now, Word Up knows because we've been going through this quite some time. Uh, but most do not know. It says, for God, verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. We're supposed to let the same mind be in us that was also in Christ Jesus. We need to agree that, yes, we, we don't hate the world. We don't, you know, partake in, 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 you know, a lot of the activities and things that they're doing. But remember, the Bible refers to Jesus as a friend of sinners, you know, and, and we condemn and we judge and we just put people down who, who, who tend to uh, so-called be friendly to those who are in the world. This is, we got to change our attitude, people. Okay, uh, because this is something that we're going to look at today and hopefully it'll help you see exactly where I'm coming from. Okay, it sounds a little awkward now because we're so conditioned. Uh, the church has been so conditioned to think and, and respond and react a certain way and it's just wrong. Okay, so we're going to work on that. I know some are feeling very uncomfortable. Many have been really uncomfortable with this understanding, but again, that's why we brought out the difference between the earth and the world, they, they are different, they're not, a, not the same. Let me read a couple of scriptures to you, I think that will help you in terms of understanding the difference between the earth and the world. Uh, da, 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 let me see where I want to go. Hebrews 1 and verse 2, Hebrews 1 and verse 2 says this, uh, for he uh, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Okay, now that's one reference. Let me go to another one. 
Uh, yeah, Revelations 11 and 15. And you can write these down. Okay, the other one was Hebrews 1 and 2. This is Revelations 11, 15. It says, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become, let's see, I'm, I'm going to read it from my translation. Okay, it says, great voices in, in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. How do you think the kingdoms, the world systems, are going to become the kingdoms of the Lord? Through us. You know, when it says through Christ, well, we are representing Christ. So this comes through us. This is a very important realm, and I think it's really high time that we start understanding that, you know, we're here for a very important purpose, and if we just keep, you know, throwing it off, then we're going to miss so much of what, you know, God has said. Look at Psalms 24, which is actually your verse of the day. Today, today's uh, verse is Psalms 24, 1 and 2. Watch what it says now. It says, the earth is the Lord's, okay? And the fullness thereof, the world. So look at the distinction between the earth and the world, okay? The worlds and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. And so he gives you the distinction between the earth and the world. And we wanted you to see that the earth and the world are not the, the, the two. They, they, they both mean something very uh, different, very distinctive. Uh, as we said before, earth is the word terra. Terra. You roll the R. Okay, it's T-E-R-R-A. Meaning, the, that's the physical planet we just read, the floods and the seas and the, uh, the, the actual, you know, natural creation, okay? Uh, but world is cosmos, okay? K-O-S-M-O-S, -O -S, cosmos, which means uh, literally worlds governing systems of control. These are the governing systems, the worlds, uh, you know, or the powers of influence, you could also say they're, they're influential, the worlds, every world will walk through uh, many of them that we just kind of wrote down, they'll be familiar with, and they have literally their growth and their function is by influence. This is so important because that's what we're supposed to have. We're supposed to have influence. This is what grows and establishes the worlds. All right, let me go on. For God so loved the worlds, okay, or the systems, the, the, the governing systems of control or the powers of influence, okay? That's really what you, I want you to see that scripture as because if we keep having this, you know, attitude against the world, we, we're going to really, we're going to miss out because it's not, like I said, supposed to be that way. Hebrews 11 and 7 says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house by that which, by the which he condemned. Now his house had to be saved. Understand that. By him, his house was saved. That's very important. Uh, okay, by the, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. And so at that time when the Lord was literally judging and dealing, he deals with the world. It's not for us to judge and deal with them. God deals with the world. Okay, when the time comes for us to judge, the scripture is very clear. That time will be clear to us, and, and that's what we'll do. But for now, you know, we are supposed to be representing Jesus, and, you know, we, we got to understand how kingdom works, okay? Okay. All right, so it's time to graduate from this religious mindset, okay, and come into the realm of the kingdom because that's what religion does. Religion is very exclusive, only certain ones. I mean, even you, as you were coming up in the church, only certain ones were gifted. Only certain ones uh, maybe spoke with, with tongues. Only certain ones. Very exclusive, and that's not the kingdom of God, okay? It's to whosoever will, okay? And God's gifts and callings are on to he pours out his spirit on all flesh. So it's not just certain people and those who, you know, want to exclude others. Doesn't work that way. 
okay? So if you don't know what time it is, this is very important, and this is why we're talking about this, because we are in a different time. This whole shut-in of coronavirus and stuff, it's, it's a shifting, and many times it takes these terrible things to happen for us to shift and change our thinking, all right? So uh, again, if you don't know what time it is, you won't know what you're supposed to be doing right now. If ever, you know, the church and believers have been praying now for the world, it's, it's been now. I've hear, heard it all over the TV. People that don't even talk about prayer are, are talking about praying, you know, and why? Well, look at what it had to come to to get everybody to see God loves his people. He loves the world. You know, he loves the actual, you know, way he created them with their creativity and their, you know, inventions and all the things that they've been able to do through this creation. He's, he's very glad he made them like that, that you were created to, to be a creator. You are co we are co-creators. You know, with God, we are partners. We're in a partnership. All right. And so we've got to, you know, stop all this exclusiveness of those only for certain people. And realize he loves the world and he wants his people to be saved. So again, Earth is a planet. Now we want to get into a, a whole understanding of, of the natural and the spiritual, as we just read, okay? Because the worlds are actually more of a spiritual understanding than the, the natural realm of Earth. You know, there are um, parables and different understandings that the natural realm can give us for the spiritual realm. All right, so Earth is a planet of time and seasons. It, it's, it's a planet of times and seasons. Now that works naturally, right? And spiritually, if there are, you know, spring and, and life-giving seasons in the natural, then there are spring and life-giving seasons, you know, in the spiritual. Uh, life itself is a measure in time. Life is a measure in time. You get that? You can write it down if you want. Life is a measure in time, okay? This is so important, people, God, why? Because time wasted is life wasted. And see, and that's why I'm so, you know, I'm really more particular now than ever before with my time, uh, you know, because there are time wasters. If you're not careful, they'll waste your time. And you have to be the steward of your life and of your time. And, you know, I let people know that, listen, I, I love, you know, fellowshipping and talking and counseling, all those things, but it needs to be with purpose. It can't be just because you feel like it. You know, I'm very careful with my words. I don't want to just run off with a bunch of words. I have to give an account for those words. So will you. We all have to give an account for every word, okay? Uh, what's it? Every idle word. So then I, I, I'm not going to just be, you know, shooting the breeze, as they say, because you feel like, you know, talking or whatever. That, that's too important to me. All right? So, again, time is an interruption in your eternity. Time is an interruption in your eternity. A moment of measure. Okay? God put man in time. But God does not live in time. And we should be so glad because if you need something at a specific time, then God knows how to make it happen before it's time. So th this is really, again, understanding the spiritual and separating it from the natural. There are some natural things that are, how can I say, they are uh, governed by time. It, it has to be, you know, in a time realm. Certain things grow at a certain pace that, you know, and only time, you know, can, you know, see that maturity of it. But God literally steps beyond time. Thank, thank God for that, right? All right. Ecclesiastes 3 and 1. Let me, let me just add to it. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3 and 1, you all know it. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose. Oh, you should really underline that because that's crucial. That's where we want to head today. Under the heaven. In other words, uh, everything has a purpose and a time, okay? Which is so wonderful because why? Time was created for your purpose to be fulfilled. Time was created so your purpose could be fulfilled. Time is not your enemy. That's why, you, you know, I, 
I, I, I say that to the body of believers because I don't know how serious we take time. You know, uh, like I said, I, I go back to just a simple example. If we say worship services at a specific time, then you should take that so serious. You shouldn't just come all, late, you know, all the time because, you know, that's how you feel about it. That's your take on it. That's, that's just not respecting time. And see, this is why you always say, I don't have time. Well, because what you don't respect, you will lose. And the more you disrespect it, the more you'll lose it. And so it's so important. If, if service begins at a certain time, then you should really make every effort to be there. Now, are, are there going to be some times, yeah, that things kind of go wrong and you're not on time? I get that. But for it to be a constant thing, you should not get upset. You don't need to get angry with someone who's trying to help you because you don't realize that time is your life. And one day you'll wish for it, and then it'll be too late. And it's so important for you to understand how God feels about time. Your life is literally a measure of time. And when you disrespect what, you know, if you say you're going to be at a certain place at a certain time, you should be there. You know, you should not just disrespect time like that. And if you know you can't be there at that certain time, why say it? Don't, don't, don't say it, <laughs> you know. Okay, just try to help you because the church really, you know, we do things so sloppy and we want the best from the Lord and we give him our, you know, our worst. So uh, time was created for, you, for your purpose to be fulfilled. All right. Let me just do this. I just stopped that from it. It's going to ring. I know it was. Okay. Now, how does God measure time? All right. Time manifests itself in seasons. Okay, time manifests itself in seasons. In other words, a year is time. It's a year of time. Seasons are the manifestation of that time. In other words, it helps you to know what time it is. Okay, it's not enough to just know the time, but what time is it? You know, what needs to take place? This is why we have four seasons. Four seasons help you to know, okay, the season is changing now. We're in spring. It's a little warmer we can start packing away some of the heavy coats and sweaters and things of that sort. Uh, you know, summer comes and then we're again changing. All, all of these things help us to know what to do at a certain time. And we're going to get that into the spiritual realm, but just get the natural realm of it. Seasons help you to know what to do. When you know what time it is, you know what to do. When you don't know what time it is, then you don't know what to do. And you can miss your time by not doing what you need to do during that time. Now, I don't want to sound like a, a, a riddle or anything like that, but I want you to really see what is being said here in terms of understanding earth and world, world and earth, how different they are, but yet how both affect our lives in many, many ways. All right. Uh, so again, how does, how does God measure time? Uh, now, to him, the measure of time is according to your purpose. Okay, it's in terms of your purpose, not your age. I want to emphasize on that because I hear so much of, oh, I'm not getting any younger, or you're too old, or you're too young, or you're too... God does not measure time by your age. It's by your purpose. So he doesn't care what age you are. You say, well, I'm getting too old for that. If your purpose has not been fulfilled, you're not too old for anything. You're just literally going to keep moving into the purpose of why you're here. And you have to see it from a realm of, of purpose, not, not age, not, you know, oh, God, my, you know my, my clock is ticking and all that kind of stuff. You know, if God has purpose for you, uh, whether it be, you know, you know, whatever your desires are, you know, it's going to happen, okay? But you'll hinder it because you know what? You'll think, oh, well, I'm getting too old, I'm getting this and I'm getting that. And then you start doing things out of season or out of their time. And that's, you know, we, we want to look into that, to that just a little bit more, okay? So, so God's question is not how old are you, but rather... What have you done, okay, in the time that he's given you? And see, it will always be inside of you that I know I need to be doing something. I know that there's more to my life than this. That, that will always be there. And as long as that's there, 
See, and I deal with that all the time. I know that there's a greater level that I gotta get to. I'm not gonna allow my age to make me give up and say, well, I'm too old for that now, or I can't, you know. As long as that urge is there, I know I have to keep pressing towards that mark of that high calling, because your purpose is your higher calling, all right? So, uh, life is not measured by how long you live, but how well you did God's will. You know what I'm saying? How long, it's, it's not about how, you know, people live a long time, oh, I've been in here, for, you know, all these many years, and they'll see how old they are and how, you know, but what have you done? You see what I'm saying? Have you fulfilled the purpose of why you were here all those many years and all that time that you had? Because without fulfilling, you're not going to be satisfied with your life because your life was meant to do something specific, and if you're not doing it, if you haven't done it, you know, then, then you know, you're going to always be thinking, you know, I wish I could have, or if I could have, and see, that's no good. Then, it, of course, it's too late. All right. So, again, let's look at the questions of life. And these are very important questions because why? Everybody needs to answer these questions. I say that kingdom is one of the answers to so much of life. And I'm so grateful for the teaching on, on kingdom because it literally answers these questions. And, again, you know who the, I, I've added, I think, two more. Okay, most of you know the first three. Who am I? Yes, you do. Right. Uh, where did I come from? Why am I here? What can I do? That's a new question. Well, what am I supposed to do? What should I be doing? And where am I going? So let's fill in. Let, let's fill in the question. Let's answer each of these questions. One word. You say, "How are you going to answer all those questions?" We're going to answer each one with one word. First of all, who am I? Is about your identity. Everybody knows that. That's important. But you'd be surprised how many people don't have a clue who they really are. I told you, when you don't know who you are, people don't mind telling you. They will tell you who they think you are. It'll be like Jesus. Who do men say that I am? Well, some say this and some say that. When you don't know who you are, that's that's what you are subject to. You to what some think you are and what they and see if you don't really uh, take, you know, ownership of who you are, then people make you who they want you to be, and that becomes a problem. <laughs> All right, and uh, where am I from? That's about your heritage, okay? Because everything. Uh, according to the scripture, God will draw all things, return all things unto himself. It's important to know where, you, your, your, where your heritage is, and it's a wealthy, rich, wonderful heritage because, again, your spirit came from the realm of God. You're from heaven. This place is not your home. It's not where, you know, you're going to be forever. There's so much more to your life, and what a blessing that is. All right, why am I here? Well, that's about purpose. That's what we've been talking about, your purpose. And unless you, okay, I gotta look at both. Okay, that's my director. I gotta look at both, sorry. Uh, unless you understand your purpose, you'll miss it. And that to me is so serious because that's, that's the reason why we're here. Why are you here? For purpose, all right? And then what can I do? That's your potential, okay? Potential is, uh, all the things that are yet inside of you that yet need to manifest. And, you know, it comes out in measures. That's why we're talking about time. Certain times, certain things are going to come forth. And you'll say, wow, that's great. I didn't know I could do that. I didn't know I, I had that. Uh, potential is really your answer to what can I do. And it's, it's an ongoing because once you learn you can do one thing, you'll also find out you can do something else. And that is so wonderful. All right, and then where am I going? That's your destiny. Destiny will always continue to call you because God placed that in you. And you should be so glad for it because it helps you to realize that you do have a purpose. And it'll always stay in. These questions will always be inside of you and they'll always be turning and pulling you towards your destiny. You know, I, I said the other four questions are what destiny is pulling you towards. Destiny kind of pulls you towards all those. All right, so your heritage, you know, from your father, Abba, your father. It's also, I think it, the Greek word is 
is pata, pata. And it's really a wonderful understanding of your father. Now we try and make our heritage and where we come from all about the earthly realm. Well, maybe physically, but spiritually, you know, that is not your heritage or where you came from. And, and that's why we can't get so caught up in the natural realm. You know, it, there was this time when everything was about the motherland. You know, everybody needs to return to the motherland. Uh, mothers don't have seed, okay? You, you have to deal with the realm of, of the father, okay, which is where you came from. Because without un that understanding, then you'll be drawn into a natural realm, which is, is always... It's always, you know, fleeing. The, the Bible says the, um, how's it go? The grass fades, the, what, the, the flower fades, the grass withers, but it's the word of God that will always stand. And so let, let's get serious about this whole business. You know, father or Abba or Pata, meaning source, okay? He's the source and the sustainer, okay? That th That's what you came from. That's really what Pata means. It's where you come from, which is which one comes from, okay? And that's father, okay? God never refers to himself as mother, okay? Never. It's a father realm. It's about seed. It's about the potential of a seed. And, you know, the seed looks insignificant, very small. That's why the Bible uses the um, mustard seed because it's so small. I think one of the smallest seeds that exist, yet it has the potential to grow into a huge huge tree and then uh, of course those trees multiply and before you know it you have a, a tremendous forest all right so uh, Hebrews 1 and 3 just the latter part of it just the latter Hebrews 1 and 3 he, he upholds all things by the word of his power okay meaning he sustains he upholds everything is upheld by the source he is the source he is your source you need to understand that doesn't matter if you had a good natural father or not. You know, some did, some didn't. Your father, your source is your God. All right. Father literally means, uh, you know, your sustain. Okay. You, you sustain. In other words, a father is not just a title. It's an action word. You can almost say it's a verb. Because it literally means you sustain what you produce. There it is. God sustains what he produces. That's why I've said unto you many times, the scripture in John, he says, you have not chose me, I have chose you. And I've said it over and over again that God's choice is God's responsibility. He wants to be responsible for you. He is not like the earthly fathers who literally can have children and think no more about it. That is not a sustainer and you know what you, you understand this if you're just producing and not sustaining you're not a father yet you can produce a seed but if you don't sustain that seed you are not a father because it's not it doesn't work that way the word literally means sustainer and unless you're sustaining what you produced then you are not a father all right women a woman came from she came from the man. This is why God set it up like this. You know, so he is her source. Now, if he can't sustain you, you need to keep moving because God has someone who will, who is a real, you know, father, who fulfills the word father. And, you know, we think every man, just because he has children, is a father. The better understanding, I know we have the word, the term spiritually for Abba, but the term naturally is pata, which means sustainer. And if he's not sustaining, he's not a father. All right? That, that's just the, the facts of it. And some may have a problem with that, but that's just the truth. Okay? Uh, you, you don't just produce. You sustain and you fulfill the term father. Okay? She came from him. He is the source. He is only a father if he is a sustainer. All right. So whenever God establishes anything in his creation, he also establishes its priorities. 
In other words, he'll give it the priority. This is what's first, okay? So the first thing God gave his man creation was work, okay? He gave him work, not a woman. You know, I've said many times to men, you had work, you had fellowship and communion with God before a woman ever came in the picture. And so when you go after a woman before you go after work, you miss the priority. You, you don't have your priorities straight, okay? You know, well, I need a woman. You don't need a woman. You need a job. You need work, okay? Because then you understand how to fulfill your purpose. You will not be satisfied till you fulfill your purpose, okay? Pata, father, sustainer. Okay, like I said, th that word father, it has, has so much more meaning to it than the way we see it. And when we Americanize something, we lose the real meaning of it and what it's really all about. All right? It, and and it, it takes you into the realm. This is why so many men are not maturing because they don't realize when you are fulfilling the realm of a sustainer, you're also maturing. Maturity is essential. Okay, in terms of your purpose, your purpose is going to literally lead you into a realm of maturity. Okay, and maturity must take place. Okay, it's it, it, you know, the church, I speak to the body of Christ, there's got to be some maturity to take place with us. We cannot, you know, continue this infantile mentality. God created us, He wanted to have fellowship with some mature, intelligent people, all right? So, you know, it's time out for, you know, excitement, but no depth. We got no depth. We just get all excited in church, and we want to jump and shout, and, you know, all that's wonderful, but you need, where's your depth? You need some depth to it, okay? You want to be deeper. You want your roots to be able to literally secure you, okay? You're anointed, but you got no character. Yeah. Your, your anointing takes you into great places and your character just brings you right back where you came from. You know, gifts but no standards, okay? And, and a gifted person with no standards is a dangerous person. Got power but no principles. No, nothing to solidly root and ground you. And again, power with no principles is even more dangerous, okay? We're flashy but we ain't got no faith. Entertainment instead of results. This is all a lack of maturity. And God is looking for a mature bride. He needs a mature. We grow up. He needs a, a, a mature bride. Jesus was not going to marry a little girl who was, you know, still baby-like, infantile, acting like a, you know, a little child. You know, look at Ecclesiastes. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I got to go there. Ecclesiastes 10, 16. Woe to you, O land, when thy king is a child and immature, and your princes eat out of season. That means they're just drinking and partying, and they got no depth, they got no character, no standards, no principle, no real faith, and therefore no results. I mean, th there's a wake-up call for the body of Christ to grow up. You know, you, there are so many great things waiting you, okay? But as I said, this immaturity, Jesus not waiting for no little girl. He ain't marrying no little immature child who don't know how to act, okay? I want to read, if I can find it real quick, let me see. I want to read Revelations. You say, oh, Pastor, you're kind of hard on us today. No, I, I just think that it'll bless you, you know, to know some things for yourself. Revelations, let's look at chapter 19. And I'll go, I guess I'll go from verses 6. Okay, just write it down if you don't, you know, you know, if you don't have a Bible at hand. It says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God, omnipotent, reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice. Give honor to him. 
For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Oh, glory to God. You, you hear that? His wife, that means she's rich, she's mature. Okay, she's got character, she's got depth, she's got standards and principles and faith. Therefore, she has all the results that says, I am ready for this union. Okay, and, 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 her was, and, and unto her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness, the right standing of the saints of God. It says, write this, okay? Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. These are the true sayings of God. This is God Almighty saying, grow up, okay? My son wants to take a bride that's mature, Okay, that's ready to, to help, to, you know, to stand by him and reign in his kingdom. Glory to God. This is so powerful to me because I can really see the body of Christ just rising up and becoming this wonderful bride who is, is wise and smart, intelligent, and, and just ready to conquer and cover. This is how Revelations 11 and 15 is going to come into manifestation. It says, and the seventh angel sounded... And there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. This is literally the realm that we want to enter into. All right. Uh, the church and the kingdom, they're not the same. The, the, I told you the church is an equipping entity. It's a training realm. It's a realm of hands-on training. We shouldn't confuse the church with the kingdom. Okay. Uh, the kingdom of God existed before the church did, okay? So, you know, when we get, deal with our identity and who we are, again, it's that same realm, Matthew 16 and 13. Whom do men say that the Son of Man is? Okay, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, you know, or, or one of the prophets. They didn't have a clue, you know, and it's only one who answered Peter. He says, you know, who do you say that I am? All right? And he certainly gave the revelation that was necessary to understand. You got to know who your Lord is. All right? Jesus Christ was never to be put in the category of the prophets. Why? It was the prophets that prophesied of his coming. Okay, they, they spake of him who was to come. They were prophesying uh, of his coming. Okay, he was never in a... Pro prophets don't own kingdoms. Prophets don't rule and reign over land. He was never in the category of a prophet. And that's very important. So let's take a look at some of the world's governing systems because this is what you need to be looking forward to and believing God for. And I think some of you who got these big visions and you don't even understand them, these callings that's in your spirit, and you don't really understand where it is and where's it going and what, what is up with this, okay? This is why you got to change your attitude towards the world, okay? The church, the body of Christ is training and equipping, and, and some of them are getting it right and some of them maybe not so right, okay? But you have an opportunity, you know, to seek ye the kingdom of God. Seek him for yourself. So let's look at some of the world systems, okay? For God so loved the worlds. And that is, that, that worlds, it's, it's plural. It really is. There's the political world, okay? There's the government, the world of government, the world of legislation or laws, okay? There's the world of economics, financial realms, okay? Bank systems. All these areas are where we need to be influencing, okay? We infiltrate and influence, okay? There's the cultural realm. It deals with all the realms of family and society and communities, okay? There's the civic societies. There's the social societies. These are the worlds that are existing right now that we're in, and we're trying to get away from them, and God is trying to get us to influence them. There's the worlds of arts, 
okay? Entertainment, music, okay? Education, the world of medicine, okay? The world of business. And of course, there is literally the different worlds of faith and it shouldn't be so many. It should all be one. I believe that's going to happen because God will draw all things onto himself. There's the world of sports. There's the sports world. And many of these, there's many, many more. Those are just some that I jot down. But the church got to stop being against these. We're supposed to influence and be a part of. And, and how can we influence if we're trying to get away from it and we're judging it and we're condemning it and, and we're, we're making people feel guilty you know, if there's a gift in you and God is manifesting that gift, he'll guide you, he'll lead you, he'll tell you where to go. But the church should not condemn someone because God has literally given them open doors where they can influence more people than the church. We have been, you know, shut into our little corners for so many years. And look at all that we've missed out and all the people that have already gone, you know, into the next life, into judgment, and maybe never had the honor. We, we mustn't keep this mentality. In other words, John 3.16, for God so loved the world. He didn't, for 17, he didn't come to judge and condemn it. Okay? We have got to get a different understanding of kingdom. We've been so religious and so church and so heavenly bound, we're earthly no good. And that is not a good way because then our, pur our purpose does not get fulfilled. Okay, because we're so against, you know, and I'm, I'm a little eerie about folk who only talk about what they're against. You know, I need to know what, you, what are you for, because you could be against me too, I don't know. All right, Matthew 16 and 16, again, that was the answer, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Okay, el Christos, it means anointed king. Okay, king, again, that's, that's a, you know, a worldwide understanding. You know, that's why I said prophet, that shuts him in. That makes him li limited. When he was all those things, glory to God. Okay, as I said before, prophets don't have kingdoms. They thought he was a prophet. Do you know there are religions right now that refer to Jesus? Well, he was a good man. He was a prophet. You know, he was a king, and he is king, and he is the king of kings. Okay? Only kings have kingdoms. Over and over, Jesus spoke of his kingdom. My kingdom is not of this world. Okay? You know, you need to take this personal so that your attitude can change as well, okay? In fact, the, the, the first and only time Jesus mentioned church was, was literally uh, in the whole realm of who, who do men say that I am. It, it's with Peter, and he says, well, on this rock, and people got that out. You know, you know there's entire churches and organizations under St. Peter because Peter got the revelation, but Jesus did not say on Peter, I'm building my church. He said on this rock or this revelation that you've received, Peter, that's what we'll build on because you needed the revelation, the understanding of it. But again, it's been turned into a religion and people have statues of St. Peter. They're praying, with, you know, that, that, wasn't, that, that wasn't the intent at, at all. All right, now Matthew 24 and 14, you probably should know it by now. Uh, Matthew 24 and 14, it says, this gospel of the kingdom, being very specific, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the worlds, okay? In all the world governing systems. When God puts you in one of those worldly positions or situations that's because he is going to anoint and use you to influence that situation he don't want you running from it oh pray that i get out of there just so worldly oh come on grow up grow up he needs you to influence that he loves the world okay go out into all the worlds influence these systems so that these kingdoms can become the kingdoms of our God. Matthew 10 and 7. He goes on and says, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven has arrived. Okay? It's, it's all about the kingdom, people. Ecclesiastics, or uh, I'm sorry, the ecclesia, okay, which also in Greek means chosen ones, okay? It's also 
came from the Greek word, it meant an earthly senate. You know what the senates do? They literally legislate the laws, which is the will of, you know, the king or the president, whoever's in charge. And that's what the church is to do. I said we are re reinforcers of what has already been laid down as law, and we're supposed to reinforce it. You know, in history of the Roman Empire, Caesar chose or appointed a senate. He chose. That's like us. We've been chosen. Okay? Only Caesar could select the ecclesia or the senate, which is what we call now the church. Okay? But it was never about religion. Okay? The Romans adopted the Greek philosophies and their writings, and they began to act out these things, and that's one of the reasons why they were so successful. The only reason why the empire was destroyed because they came against Christians, believers, saints, God's chosen, okay? And in that, they were, that was their own destruction. The ecclesia was to record whatever the king said and turn it into legislation and establish it. Ooh, that doesn't sound like church. Well, that's what the ecclesia did. The ecclesia was to record whatever the king said and turn it into legislation and establish it, okay? That's what it really was about. It was never about a religion and all the things that we have, you know, the rituals that have been created and, oh, my God, all, all, all kinds of different man-made doctrines and, and, you know, dress codes and, we dress people out, up and dress them down and put on this and don't put on that. And, and I'm amazed, you know, of uh, the, the strict, you know, um, attitudes of certain organizations and, and the people on the inside are dying. You, you fix them the way you think they should look on the outside and you don't care about what's going on in the inside. Inside they are dying. You know, they can't wear pants but they can fornicate. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the pulpit is trying to look something that they're not. And again, that where is the concern for the word of God and his people? He loves his people. And we've got all of these, these church, what we call church. And it's so far from the original, real, you know, realm and meaning of what Jesus brought to us. He didn't bring us a religion. Behold, a child is born, a son is given. And the government, not the religion, the government shall be on his shoulders. He was bringing the world systems and we've turned what should have been a universal realm of learning and revelation into a very limited realm called religion. All right, I'm just about to wrap it up here. A couple more things. It seems like you're a little rough today, Pass. It's because I'm getting you ready. Getting you ready for the bridegroom. So you'll be nice and mature. So you'll understand. All right, Genesis 3, 23 and 24 tends to answer why we're having the problems that we have and the mindsets that are just so far from the original. Genesis 23 and 24 it brings us into the realm of fall. A violation of stewardship, you know, ir irresponsible act. Uh, and again, it goes to the, back to the source, the original. It, it's, uh, he, he was, uh, you know, in a place called mismanagement. And mismanagement brings loss. You know, we've been talking to you about management. God really gave the earth really realm to us to manage it not to try and own it. God forbid if we owned it, what a mess it would be, and that's why it is, because some think we own it. We do not. We are stewards of what he has allowed us to manage. Uh, you know, that's why he came to Adam. He did not come to Eve first. He came first to Adam. Adam, where are you? Okay, he went to the source. Okay, she came from him. He is the source. Irresponsibility is abandonment abandonment of conscience and ignorance of accountability. Let me say that again. Irresponsibility is abandonment of conscience and ignorance of accountability. Got that quote from the great Miles Monroe, and I said I agree fully. Irresponsibility is an abandonment of conscience 
and ignorance of accountability because people rather someone take the blame than be responsible. That's immature. God will put you out of what he put you in. And that's what happened. He put him in the garden. But when that violation took place, he put him out. And people think, oh, well, God is so merciful. He's so God is wise and he absolutely is just. He will do what is just. Okay, why? For your sake. The Bible says he put them out for their sake. All right? And, and, and watch this. He'll protect people from your immaturity. Okay? When you are immature and irresponsible and walking in a place of ignorance where you refuse to grow and come into who God has purposed you to do, then people need to be protected from you. And I say that with great conviction because I thank God for some of the things that I prayed for that did not happen and did not come to pass. Because I obviously was not ready for it. Obviously, he knew it. I didn't. I'm praying for one thing. Something else is happening. And I thought at the time that this is just terrible. It was the best thing that ever could happen. It'll bless you. Listen, own up to some of your stuff. Don't, don't try to. Ain't nobody perfect. Ain't nobody without sin. Folk tickle me. We just get all up. Oh, please. Just calm all that down. And, and go ahead and confess and let the Lord bless you. Matthew 4 and 1. Matthew 4 and 1, Jesus was led of the Spirit where? Into the wilderness. Okay? Everyone needs a wilderness spirit. You need that experience, that wilderness test, to test you for provision, for protection, and for power. How do you go about trying to provide for yourself when he said, I'll provide? It helps you to humble yourself and look to him for your provision. It helps you to humble yourself and trust God for your protection. Stop being scared. Stop being afraid. Empower. I told you, it's really not about what you don't have. It's what about what you do have. Because when you get things and start making bad decisions, you don't even know how to handle power. It's very important. This is all maturity. It's all maturity, people. It's all about growing up. Grow up. Okay, like I said, Jesus ain't going to be marrying no little girl for no bride. Okay, Joshua 5 and 11, verses 11 and 12. Joshua 5, and I'm moving a little quickly. I think my time is just about running out probably have to stop somewhere in here. All right. After they ate their first meal. Now we're talking about the children of Israel out in the wilderness. And like I said, wilderness experience is good because it'll hopefully it'll grow you up. And I said, hopefully, because guess what? Do you know that experience? That's why I said in our last session, experience is not necessarily the best teacher because all people who go through certain things, it don't change. It don't, Israel went through all of that. They saw the hand of God. They saw the sea parted. They saw the pillar by day and by night, manna coming from heaven, quails. They saw and experienced that and did not change. See, this is why I want you to understand something. God is not going to uh, just control and change your mind for you. He won't do that. He'll give you enough experiences that will hopefully help you but experience is not always the best teacher, and some people don't even learn from really rough, hard stuff. I know people who have gone through some terrible things, come out the same, ain't a bit better. So this is really important for you to realize. Uh, Paul said, uh, you know, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, and so on and so on. He says, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. You, you see that? He had to do it. Wasn't nobody going to do it for him? nobody's going to try and make you grow up. You have to see your immature, you know, behavior and the things that you really could do better, but you're so used to, you know, manipulating and using immaturity to have your way, and you don't realize you ain't hurt nobody but yourself. That's you that's going to be missing out on your purpose and why you're here. So again, here the Israelites are. He's done everything. And, and if you keep reading, you know, most of them died off because they just wouldn't learn. They were their own, you know, death ticket because why they kept speaking death. Would that we have died in Egypt. Would that we were this. And they just never were able to get Egypt out of them. God got them out of Egypt, but they never got Egypt out of them. And... That's a very sad thing, okay? Uh, but with Joshua, 
They said Moses had took them as far as he could take them, even missing out on the promised land himself. And I want to say to ministers, pastors, you know, those of you that are called, the rulers, don't let people make you miss out, okay? They refuse to grow up. You've done what you can do. Don't, don't miss out on your promised land because folk won't listen, won't do what they need to do. So I say you can, you know, you can help them minister, do it, but God will always tell you when, you know, enough is enough. And Joshua, he was the enough is enough. In other words, you know, you're going to choose this day who you're going to serve. You're going to do one or the other, okay, but you can't do both. So after they ate their first meal in the promised land, this is Joshua 5, 11, and 12. You see they had the Passover. They ate their first meal in the promised land. And the Bible says in verse 12, the manna stopped. Whew. Yes. They were used to collecting manna in the morning, collected. Some of them were still disobedient. He told them, don't try to keep it all day. Just get enough for today. If you keep it overnight, it's going to smell. It's going to collect worms. It's going to be disgusting. Get rid of it. Just enough for each day, and he instructed them, and they had the manna. And when it was time for them to grow up, okay, and he got to where he got them where they needed to be, where they had to. Now, listen. By the time they got to Canaan, they had to learn how to fight, because you understand they were slaves. Slaves don't know how to fight. So Joshua had to train them. They had to learn how to fight. This is why I teach spiritual warfare, because babes in Christ, they do not know how to fight. They don't realize they have an enemy, and you know, the wrong message for so many years. Oh, you just need to get saved and everything going to be all right. What a mess that turned out to be. I know that's what I was told. And I, I mean, I don't say that anymore, ever. And I hope nobody's still saying that because you got to learn how to fight. You have to have your wilderness period. You have to learn how to love God and trust him. He bring you through a little thing and bring you through something else. And after a while, you start to learn that, yes, I'm going through this, but God is going to bring me out. You learn to grow up, to be mature. But certainly after that first meal in the promised land, the manna stopped. And some of you, the manna's going to stop. And you better be ready to grow up and do what you need to do. All right? It was time for them to learn management, responsibility, okay, the security of what God had told them on the word and not what they felt, not their emotions, okay? It was time for them to learn management instead of waiting for manna. You know, waiting for somebody to do something for them. You know that how to be the church. They just want everything to be coming to them. Okay, and God does that when you're a babe because that's how you do babies. But at some point, you're, a baby grows up, okay? And, and that baby has to learn how to, you know, live and, and you know, get through life and so on and so forth. And, and the church has got to understand something. You know, those of you who are babes and you're just coming into the world, it's time for you to learn now. Learn how, how, what it is to be a good manager. Manage the things God gives you. you. You know, you messed up before and he blessed you right back again. Okay? You went and got that car, he didn't tell you to. And you, you want God to pay for what he didn't order. Mm-hmm. And, and, but, he, but he took care of you anyway. And blessed you and gave you that. At some point, you have to learn. You have to grow up. Okay? All right. I, I know. I say, oh, you're so rough today. I, I'm, I'm just getting you ready for what's to come. I told you, you're not going to be shut in forever. This little virus stuff going to pass. And I'm telling you, you're going to see life is at a whole new level. You, you need to be ready. I'm getting you ready in Jesus' name. Okay? So God worked for Moses. But he worked with Joshua. In other words, when Moses just pulled, pick up the stick, put it out, the water opened up. Joshua had to do first. They had to step first. They had to take step first, and then he did it. Okay? Because why? They, the, the people were still depending on somebody to do something. See, the security, slavery becomes a security. Okay? The security of slavery is the absence of responsibility. Why? Because somebody is responsible for you. And as long as they take care of you, you don't even care how they treat you. You don't care what they do to you. You don't care uh, as long as you have the security of not having to be responsible for yourself. That is slavery. And they have become so used to that. Okay? And God was trying to get them out of that. And that's what you need. All of these are examples. The Bible says these were examples for us. Okay? All right. Hebrews 1 and 2. He says, has in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also 
He made the worlds, okay? And again, we keep dealing with that world so there are so many scriptures that uh, hopefully it's going to help you get a better understanding of what those scriptures are saying when he talks about the world. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3 and 11. Ecclesiastes 3 and 11. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set the world in their heart. The world, eternity, the whole realm of life. He placed it in us. We're going to stop there. We have so much more to go in terms of understanding the realm of earth and world. Uh, but we'll stop there. We've given you a lot. We, we fussed with you a little bit. I hope you understand how important it is because, like I said, as this whole uh, COVID-19 things begin to wind down, you're going to see life has changed quite a bit. And God is expecting his chosen to be the mature vessels that he needs to take the lead now, take the responsibility. It's not you trying to do it on your own. It's you doing it again through the realm of God. God wants to do it through you, okay? He wants you to understand that there's certain changes you want to start making right now, okay? Certain levels of dependency should be on the Lord. When you start depending on people too much, that's when you get upset and that's when you get frustrated because you want people to do what only God can do. And that becomes a level of disappointment to you. So just know that he made you a certain way for your purpose. And you're literally in your measure and your time right now so that your purpose can be fulfilled. And I hope you'll get literally, you know, on fire for the Lord in terms of the purpose that he has for you. And trust him. You know, where he's placed you, you know, then trust him for that. Trust him for that. Don't whine and complain. Don't be like the, the, the Israelites where no matter what he did, it was never enough. Enough was never enough. They were always, you know, complaining and he'd do this and then they still, you know, it, it's amazing how they wanted meat and then he gives them, you know, the, the fowls and the birds and, you know, next thing you know, they're acting, you know, well, we're sick of it. They, they ate so much until it made them sick. They ate so much flesh. Just enough is not, that, that's immaturity, people. Growing up is wonderful. Being mature is wonderful. Okay, learning yourself is wonderful. And all of those things have to do with your maturity and your growing up. Well, again, uh, we'll stop there and we're going to continue uh, as we come back. Again, like I said, we'll finish this out this month. And then we want to take you into a very important realm of the kingdom in terms of a whole different understanding of what it means uh, to be a witness unto the Lord. Entirely, entirely different. It will not be any way that you thought it was in terms of the religious understanding of what it is to be someone that God uses in these days. So God bless you. Again, we continue to lift you all up, all first responders that are out there, frontliners. We are lifting you up in prayer daily. And again, we love hearing from you. Uh, thank you, different ones who have written me from time to time. I appreciate it. Love hearing from you. Keep keep it coming uh, because we do read everything. Uh, students, get your papers in. Uh, we love reading and hearing from you. I know that many of you are having some great experiences. We want to hear about it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to pray. You have a blessed day that you continue to grow. Maybe you'll want to listen to this again and... Uh, you know, smooth out those edges in Jesus' name. So, Spirit of the living God, we thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word. Thank you for all of those new viewers that are joining us, Lord. Let the word penetrate their hearts and show them the greatness that you have called them to in Jesus' name. Bless now, O oh God, uh, again, all those that are out on the front lines. We cover them with the precious blood of Jesus. We cover them in Jesus' name that no hurt, harm, or danger come to them that literally you bless them and increase them all the more in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We call all things done, and it is so in Jesus' name. Bless you.